Before Billie Eilish swept the big four at the Grammys, before Olivia Rodrigo became a teenage pop star and supernova, there was Lord. Miss Ella Yelich O'Connor shook up the pop music landscape of the early 2010s. At just 16, her debut single Royals topped the charts worldwide. She was the youngest performer in years to do so in the States. She walked away with two Grammys, including Song of the Year for it, and has gone on to create some of alt pop's most acclaimed and polarized music. It's been a decade since Lord dropped Pure Heroine, her debut album. I've already made a video about it, but I wanted to revisit it because Lord and I are contemporaries in age, so this record spoke to me at the time of its release, and even now retrospectively. In this video, we will properly recap the era, discuss the music, and weigh the impact that she's had on the industry. I can't believe it's been 10 years. Before Pure Heroine. The daughter to a civil engineer and a published poet, Lord seemed like she was born to be a star. Her mother's background and her natural interest in literature and writing carried over into her songwriting. At just 12, she appeared on a Radio New Zealand show to perform covers which drew the attention of Universal Music Group executives, including her first manager. Lord wouldn't properly find her footing in the industry until she found a producer and ally in Joel Little. Little himself had been a frontman for a New Zealand-based punk band, Goodnight Nerd. Together, they recorded what would become the Love Club EP, a solid five-track project that contained her future hit, Royals. Remember guys, this was November 2012, a time where there was no TikTok and Twitter was not a place for stands. To gain traction, Lord had to publish this EP for free on SoundCloud. It was only after it was downloaded 60,000 times that UMG even bothered releasing it for sale. In March 2013, where it charted number two in New Zealand and modestly everywhere else, Love Club was a clever prelude to Pure Heroine. It had this unique dark sound for the time, the fusion of alt-rock and hip-hop really evoked the sensibilities of Lana Del Rey. But the lyrics inverted the ironic campy reverence for glamour and fame with a direct apathy and criticism from the lens of a suburban ingenue. Royals was a perfect introduction for the mainstream to Lord. It tied into her stage name, it provided an understated contrast to the maximalist pop landscape of the early 2010s. Some will argue that this song itself helped lead to the implosion of traditional pop during that time. Over a simplified bass line, finger snaps, and a hip-hop sound, Lord deconstructs the consumerist fantasy usually presented by pop music. Instead, she croons that most listeners will never be royals, merely just simple folk from torn up towns daydreaming of things that they will never have. Royals is actually one of the first songs to truly take advantage of going viral on Spotify after being featured in Sean Parker's public playlist. It would later be added to Spotify's viral chart before a well-timed radio campaign and sales propelled it to number one. Ironically, it would go on to be certified diamond. Keen to capitalize, work on Pure Heroine proceeded. Lord noted early on that she wanted to have a very cohesive piece of music, hence her and Joel Little being the only credited writers and producers on the entire album. A follow-up to Royals, Tennis Court, was released in the summer. It was a huge success in Oceania, but it had modest results elsewhere. This track hinted at the record's themes of suburban teenage NUI and the aftermath of achieving fame in a modern world at such a young age. The album began to near its completion towards Towards the end of summer 2013. Lord Little and her manager at the time had pared down the project to a simple clean 10 tracks. It is said that 8 tracks did not make the final cut, excluding Love Club tracks, which would be added in an extended version of the record for streaming. A third single released due to a leak team would prove that Lord was not a one-hit wonder. The track managed to even peak at 6 in the states. Team was my favorite single at the time. It was an ode to the mother country that she had, New Zealand and her friends. It was a synthy clapback to songs asking us to put our hands up in the air. Then it was time to drop the album. Pure Heroine and Its Legacy the album dropped to positive reception, with many noting it as a charming debut and a smart introspective record that explored the mind of a quiet girl touching on post-digital youth culture. Pure Heroine would top many year-end lists like the New York Times and was nominated for Best Pop Vocal Album. Commercially, it opened at number 3 on the top 200, selling 129,000 units. It would eventually sell a million units by February the following year, making her the first woman at the time since Adele to hit that mark with just their debut. Lord would go on to win Grammys for Royals, perform at Coachella, embark on an international solo tour, and become a curator for the Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1 soundtrack. On that soundtrack, 
soundtrack, she would contribute the underrated Yellow Flicker beat, earning her a Golden Globe nomination. Amongst the collaborators for that soundtrack was Charlie XCX, who had been confused for her in a joke interview, and requested an email to get the vibes for her underrated contribution kingdom. Ten years later, Pure Heroine's impact continues to be felt. The album caused a reckoning of sorts where artists became concerned with authenticity after years of dance pop domination. Likewise, Lord spawned a rise in signing younger introspective acts in her vein, contemporaries such as Halsey with her beloved Badlands, Troy Sivan whose blue neighborhood was just very much a gay Pure Heroine, and Alessia Cara. They all owe so much to Lord. Through Pure Heroine, Lord had helped shown labels that teens didn't just want superficial boy bands and teen idols. They wanted musical role models who inspired them and told their stories back to them. Even to this day, recent pop upstarts like Conan Gray and Olivia Rodrigo, who even said that Driver's License had been inspired by Pure Heroine, these artists are here because of her. There's a reason it's made many decade and an all-time list so far. Pure Heroine, alongside other debut projects like Born to Die, which I think that it's deeply indebted to, thematically and sonically, these albums really did ensure the 2010s left a mark on the pop music landscape. Okay, let's talk about the album. From its bold title, it's clear that Pure Heroine wanted to mean something, to be intellectual, to be cutting. It's a double entendre, the first meaning a jab at how many would see Lord, a young precocious teenage girl who has not been ruined by the world yet. The other is a reference to, well, hard drugs, a staple in the image of rich, wild, and free pop stars. One thing that I realized re-listening to it is that this record is really humorous. It's a contradiction of using pop music to fight against the genre. There's a lot of glib lines calling out party culture and the sounds of the era while also playing with them to tell a new story. The core record itself of 10 tracks all sound cohesive and belong to each other, but each does tell a standalone story. They really feel like entries into different days or moments passing in Lord's life. Tennis Court is an explosive EDM downbeat opening with the line, don't you think it's boring how people talk? It's very clear that Lord is starting a dialogue. The verses are so observational yet artful. The lines, I'll see the veins of my city like they do in space, showcase Lord's ability to paint imagery. The tennis court itself is a place where wealthy suburban teens go to gossip about the town, but it almost feels like a royal court that she's singing about. The chorus is just something else, the contrast between the class clown and the beauty queen in tears. I'm gonna admit that the first time I heard it's a new art form, I thought I heard iPhone, which would have still worked, and and that bridge you could watch from the window being an allusion to how we're starting to see the world from our phones at the time. Genius. 400 Lux is the most romantic song on the record. The winnowing synth that opens the track feels like a simple road we're traveling down with a friend. The first verse sticks with me. Killing time is romanticized. Got a lot to not do. Let me kill it with you. It's so smooth. And when it comes back as the bridge, you smile. The pre-chorus itself is just hooky. She makes the mundane drive feel so romantic. The transition to the chorus is just immaculate. And I like you in the back as she sings about how she loves driving past cookie cutter homes, pointless conversations, and tree streets of suburbia. It's a snapshot of a first love going nowhere fast. 400 Lux itself is a sly reference to how bright the sunrise and sunsets are. Royals I've already talked about, but I do want to note that the confidence in her voice, she sounds so distinct on the radio way back then. You'd have all these cute bops and then suddenly the thumping monolith of a track focused Based on the singer's voice and the harmonies. The way that she sings Ruler, drawing out the sounds before speeding up for the Queen Bee part before almost sighing, let me live that fantasy. It doesn't quite follow the calculus of traditional pop, but it feels so earnest and almost poetic. Ribs is one of my personal favorites. The first time I heard this track felt like an ascension. It's ethereal, bittersweet, beautiful, the way that Lord ships her voice from a hardened, ashy, smoky sound in the verses to a younger, brighter tone in the chorus. It really speaks of the themes of being scared of getting old. She says that she'd been inspired by a party that she threw with her sister, making her wonder if she could go back to a time of innocence after becoming an adult. We need to note that the lyrics are really mostly repeated lines, never quite shifting. It really speaks to the hazy feeling of being in a trance or a panic attack. Each line feels like an incantation, willing the listener to stay the same, but the richest lines for me are in the bridge. I want them back, I want them back, the minds we had, the minds we had, the nostalgia of youth and not 
not becoming embittered and old, it still crushes me every time. Buzz Cut Season's fascinating because it's all about these contrasts between innocent summer shared between friends and suburban bliss and the cruelty of the real world. The pre-choruses relay explosions on TV but contrasts them with summers by the pool. It really does show that she and her friends live in this bubble of denial and bliss. The chorus talks about never being able to come back home to these old times and living in a hologram, this artificial, safe, but unreal memory palace, but never getting to relive these moments past. It becomes clear that nostalgia is a core facet of the record. Teams this terrific tribute to her home and the people who occupy it. She paints the world of New Zealand as a kingdom ruled by her. She contrasts her imaginary palace with her boys with skin that have craters like the moon, which she considers itself to be like a brother to her. The pre-chorus and the chorus themselves are so synergistic. The line, we sure know how to run things, feels like a callback to Miley's rerun things, things don't run we, from We Can't Stop. You know we're on each other's team is so simple but so sweet. My favorite line still has to be the one about being over getting told to throw my hands up in the air and how it really does sound like another jab at party club music of the time, her form of rebellion. Glory and Gore is a masculine track that feels like Cousins with tennis court sonically, I think that this track convinced the Hunger Games people to get her for that. The imagery here is really clear, I was never a fan of it. But I really do admire how Lord points out that celebrity culture itself is just as petty and as silly as suburban fights between kids. Everyone a rager but secretly their saviors is a clever couplet because it implies that rebellious disruptors might actually have a point. The bridge is chatty and wordy, but she really floats through the beat effortlessly. Still saying it's a less conventional track, it really follows the structure of a pop song, but it sounds so scattered and stream of consciousness. It almost feels like she's relaying her innermost thoughts to us. The instrumental is hypnotic. I have to say it's still one of the weaker tracks for me. White Teeth Teens was a standout for me when the album dropped. It perfectly describes how it feels being part of a clique when you're younger. Lord really does build up this perfect image of cool kids only to relay that she's not really one of them with her sad hipster tumblr blog. The bridge is a fun twist because it deconstructs the idea that Lord ever truly wanted to be like them in the first place, and she'd rather spend her days sitting around doing nothing. The instrumental is a joy, the textures really make the song for me, the little chime and the way that the drums kick. I like the little detail that the white teeth teens actually hate being perfect with the hairpins drop lyric. The album closer, A World Alone Next to Ribs, is my personal favorite. It ties all of the songs together, the first few lines bookend 400 Lux when she's in a car with someone that she loves, then she's talking about bad habits to kick before the refrain kicks in. The people are talking. This is an idea that started in tennis court. The chorus sets it up that she doesn't really care like let them talk because we're dancing in a world alone. It expands later on to talk about liars and cheats, but how she really doesn't care because she has a best friend to dance with in that lonely world. Now that I'm older, my personal favorite verse from this entire record has to be the one where she calls out her fake friend studying business while she studies the floor bored with them. The lines, maybe the internet raised us or maybe people are jerks, resonates so well in today's world. She closes out with the words let them talk, which ends the whole record. It really bookends the entire idea. Like, she's grown up and now she's accepted the world the way it is. People always have something to say. I talk about the extended version, but that was dismantled to make the Love Club EP a thing again. But I will mention the very underrated No Better, which almost feels like an epilogue or a missing chapter. It's more mature than Pure Heroin with its tricky little lines that allude to teenage desire and more explicit subjects over the course of a sticky, hot summer afternoon. The atmosphere is brilliant, and it really does make me wish that she had worked with Joel Little a little bit more, who'd go on to produce many of the singles off Taylor's Lover. Overall, all Pure Heroin is still a powerful record. It's a stunning, clean, simple debut record that is fixated on capturing vivid memories of suburban teenage summers before the crushing grip of reality and adulthood renders us painful and nostalgic for better days. Though looking back, were those really the best times of our lives or are we just so unhappy with today and scared for tomorrow that we convince ourselves that's true? Lord merely answers with a shrug, I answer with a 9.5 out of 10 rating. And that's a wrap, it's insane to me that I had made a video about this album five years ago for its fifth year anniversary. That 
video did not have the structure or the skill or the technicality or the confidence that I have today and that really means a lot to me. A quick shout out to members, my subscribers, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much for the support. I will be back soon with a bangers video. Hopefully I get it in on time. Again, you know, thank you so much. I can't believe it's been five years for my channel and like 10 years for pure heroin. Time flies. See you next video.